Okay. All right, everybody. Hello. Hello, everyone. What a, what a great turnout here at the end of our quarter. I'm, I'm really excited to see all of you. Um, and so this, what you're about to experience is a tech talk from the Tech Policy Lab. For the very few of you who might be new to the lab, uh, the Tech Policy Lab is an interdisciplinary research unit um, at the University of Washington that spans computer science, information science, and law. And we put together interdisciplinary teams to try to gain traction on difficult, complex issues of tech policy. Um, and we also do some convening and uh, community building as we are doing today. We have um, uh, eminent scholars coming from all over the world, all over the country to speak to us about important, timely issues of the day. And this is definitely no exception. Um, I'm very delighted to be able to welcome um, um, our, our colleague at NYU and, and my friend Barry Friedman. Um, Barry is a um, absolutely preeminent constitutional uh, uh, scholar um, and one of the um, leading people in the world specifically on law and policy around policing. And indeed he is the founding director of the policing project at NYU. Um, and he is very well known to the law and tech community as a, a, a sober eyed, sophisticated participant in all things having to do with intersection of technology and society. Um, and so I'm really excited to welcome here to talk about keeping personal data safe from law enforcement. Um, you can read more about uh, Barry in his bio, um, but I'm going to welcome him right now. So Barry, thank you so much. And please come on up. Please join me in welcome Barry. Thank you, Ryan. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I had come to Seattle to uh, do some work at Microsoft and do some work at the Seattle Police Department. And Ryan was kind enough to ask me to come. And I imagined that there would be 12 people in a room sitting around a table and we would casually talk. And I got an email telling me that there would be this many people. And all I could conclude was either you don't have exams here like we have them at NYU, or uh, this topic is incredibly interesting to you, but I'm really, really glad uh, to see you. Uh, and having said that, I'm gonna disappoint you because you know I know how academic talks go. First of all, they begin with like an overly generous introduction, which is what Ryan just did, uh, though we are friends and I appreciate it. Uh, and then somebody comes up and tells you about something new and interesting and everybody asks questions to poke holes at it and needs to edify. Uh, and that's not going to happen because I'm actually coming to you with a problem. Uh, there's something I've been working on that I can't figure out. I, I just stumbled into, literally stumbled into, um, though part of the stumble, I should say, came from Sue Gluck at Microsoft who pointed me in a direction. But a problem I've been working on that cuts across a lot of things I'm writing. And so I want to talk to you about that and I want to get your thoughts. And the problem is, what do we do about the aggregation of huge amounts of personal, often intimate information sitting in the hands of law enforcement. And what I'm not gonna say to you is, well, they just shouldn't have it because they already have it. Uh, and I am gonna suggest to you, and I am working on this part of it, a framework for how to think about that and for what we should do about it. But the question that's really been tugging at me is who should hold it, assuming that it's held. And we can certainly put on the table that it shouldn't be held at all. But assuming that it's held, who should hold it? How should it be held? And what should access to it look like? And so. I'm gonna start by just explaining how we got into this problem. I'm gonna to try to give you some sense of the scope of it. This is gonna be the bumpy part of the talk just because I never know how to describe the scope because we don't know enough and it's a little mind bending. Uh, and then I'm gonna tell you about work I am doing to develop a framework. And that's gonna lead right into this puzzle I've been struggling with that has led me to, to personally a really surprising solution for me. Uh, and I'm actually gonna talk about some work that Ryan and I uh, did together on the Axon AI ethics board. So, Let's start with the problem, which is why does law enforcement have all this personal information of ours you know, stashed away? And there are two or three factors that I think lead to that. So one of them is just digitization. I mean, that's obvious, but it's worth just stopping to observe it. So there's this 1989 case, um, which was um, uh, a case to obtain FOIA records from government of rap sheets of people who were suspected members of a crime family. It's filed by uh, uh, Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. And uh, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And one of the arguments that the reporters made was, there's no reason this 
information shouldn't be FOIA. I mean, you could go to courtrooms and you could go to police departments and you could put together all the information. And the court says, no, you can't get it anyway. And Justice Stevens writing in what seems almost quaint in 1989, it's not that long ago, uh, is, uh, though I realize that many of you might not have been born, uh, is that, um, says, you know, but it's a whole different thing if it's like on a computer that you can just get it in one place. That was my soundtrack. That's my walk-in music. It was a little late. Um, so, you know, it's a whole different story if it's on a computer and you can just get it all in one place. And that's true, but digitization has created, as, as you well know, created this vast amount of information that's easily accessible. But the other thing that's happened is policing has changed in its nature. And that's not necessarily because of the technological revolution that we're in. So, you know, back in the day, and this is kind of an overstatement of the situation, but not fully. Back in the day, what the police did was investigate crime. And so if they thought you did something or you did something or you did something, they would, you know, investigate. They would try to figure out whether they had cause to take certain kind of action. So call that an investigative model. But what's happened over time is that policing has generally moved from an investigative model to a more programmatic model of policing. It's gone from a model where we have suspicion about people to a model where we just after people, whether we have suspicion or not. So examples, airport security. You know, one of the things I ask my students about halfway through criminal procedure is, okay, now you've learned the basics of criminal procedure. How come nobody needs a warrant to like stop you when you go through airport security, right? Think about DWI. Uh, roadblocks. It's kind of the same thing, right? We don't have any suspicion to think anybody's done anything wrong. We put that stuff there for a deterrent purpose. We don't really want to pick up all the guns and bombs going onto an airplane, though we certainly want to pick up the guns and bombs going onto an airplane. But the whole idea is we've got the security apparatus, so people just leave them at home. But what's happened now is that we're living in a world of digital programmatic policing, which is that the police are grabbing all the data they can on everybody for whom they can get it. Uh, whether there's any suspicion, and in fact, usually there is no suspicion that you've done anything wrong. They're just building dossiers on everybody. And I want to be clear that in this, well, first, let me just say, and why are they doing it? I mean, not certain why they're doing it. I could give you some reasons. Partly it's deterrent. I mean, if you know that everywhere you go and everything you do is being watched all the time in some dystopian way, you're probably going to behave better. But also, there's this whole concept of that was really became popularized after 9-11, which is that there's a, if you want to find a needle in a haystack, you know, you got to collect the haystack. And so if we want to solve crimes after the fact, it really helps to know where everybody was location wise and when they were using their phones and whatnot. Data mining, right? We're going to be predictive and figure out who's likely to be engaging in criminological activity. So all these reasons have led to this sucking in of all the data. And to be clear, it doesn't necessarily all exist in one place. In fact, it's digital, it doesn't have to. I don't know that there's a dossier on all of you. It's all very secretive. I'm guessing that there isn't, but there could be quickly if law enforcement wanted to. And I do know that it's sometime not very far in the future that is actually going to exist. And I'm gonna, again, talk about some work that, that I've done with Ryan in that regard. So how serious of a problem is it? This is gonna be the bumpy part of the talk because I can't I have, tried and tried and tried to think of an orderly way to explain this, and I don't have one. But so, you know, what do police do? Well, one thing they do is that they go out and they buy enormous amounts of data on all of you. So folks like Thomson Reuters and LexisNexis, the people that publish your case books and give you online databases, sell enormous numbers, amounts of information to law enforcement. They claim to have, you know, up to like 3,000 data points on sort of anybody. And we know that it's in law enforcement hands because Center for Democracy and Technology did a great study where they FOIA'd a bunch of government procurement contracts. And they found that particularly the federal agencies, ICE and Customs and Border Patrol and the DEA had contracts to get all of this data. So, you know, travel data, location data, we're all focused on health data now, uh, women that are tracking their periods so that they can aim, aid pregnancy, that data is vulnerable now, all of that. Uh, we also know that you know people give data to law enforcement. So everybody that's got a Ring doorbell, there's a system where Ring can go out on behalf of law enforcement. We actually did an audit of that system and request all that that information goes into law enforcement hands. Um, 
law enforcement collects a lot of it themselves. So, you know, one of the things I hate the most on the planet are license plate readers, which record the location of cars when they go by these cameras. They're incredibly pervasive. It's a very, very intensive form of location tracking. Uh, it's getting much more sophisticated. DNA, policing agencies collect a lot of DNA. You know, there are formal state labs for DNA of people uh, who've been victimized, who have been incarcerated, uh, and it's available through a federal system. But a lot of policing agencies just got frustrated with that and started to create their own local DNA databases. The NYPD and the medical examiner in Manhattan set up a huge database and they, you know, people they come in contact with, that they just grab their DNA and they just store it away. And there are all kinds of databases that you hear about. For example, there's a, uh, the National Crime Database that like if you're ever stopped by the cops and they go back and they call you in, right? And that's a database that has information on stolen vehicles and people that are fugitives and missing persons. Um, there are databases that are run. There's, a, there's one system of databases that we don't know a lot about that's run. It's private, but run by all the states uh, called Enlets that, that says that it engages in you know, over a billion transactions a year. Um, there are companies like ShotSpotter, famous for their uh, gunshot detection technology, but they have something called Copling, where they assemble all of this information from uh, record management systems of police departments and computer assisted dispatch, and they put it into a database that's available to all of these policing agencies. So, and then you've probably heard or maybe have not heard about fusion centers, which are these centers that were set up after 9-11 to fuse together. This is exactly the problem, all of our data, so that we would have a way of, you know, uh, not missing somebody who's at loose, a terrorist or whatnot, but they're now used for all crimes, all hazards. Um, and most of this collection of data, this is the last thing I'll say about it, and I'm pivot, is most of it's not authorized in any democratically accountable way. In fact, we've sued the state of Oregon. They operate a fusion center that there's, you would be hard pressed to find a statute anywhere on the books that gives any authority to have such a center, uh, fusion center. And yet it was used to spy on Black Lives Matter protesters, on indigenous folks that were fighting a, a natural gas pipeline. So huge amounts of data about, it. just take for granted. I don't know exactly how much, and I don't know what they've got, how they use it. That's part of the problem, but ton of data. So what should we do about it? So I just published um, a little paid announcement here uh, in NYU Law Review, an article called Lawless Surveillance. And the article basically makes the case that when police collect your private information, they, as a matter of constitutional law, cannot, unless there are certain requisites that are met. What I did is I went and read tons of cases that had nothing to do with policing. Some did have to do with policing, but all the cases where government collects private information and where there's litigation over it, and from all those cases, you can piece together that courts generally don't let government get your private information unless certain requirements are met. So none of this gets applied to policing. I'm gonna tell you what the requisites are in just a minute. None of this gets applied to policing. And my argument is all of that collection by policing agencies, flat out invalid. Frankly, unless it's authorized democratically, they need to dump it all. And the requisites in my view are first, there's gotta be democratic authorization to collect the information. Second, there's gotta be transparency. Third, this is gonna sound just like con law to all of you. There's gotta be a legitimate government reason for doing it. Fourth, there's gotta be proof that collecting the information is gonna further the government purpose. Then there have to be safeguards to minimize the collection, to talk about how long the retention uh, period is. Uh, and then there always has to be process for the police to get that information and use it. And judicial review, if you wanna challenge the collection, okay? That's information that the police collect. Well, you might just say, listen, I was listening to you. You told us about all these data brokers. They don't need to collect any of it. Why don't they just go buy it? So Danielle Citrin and I are writing an article now trying to figure out what to do about that problem, which is when the police don't collect the information themselves, but they just go get it some other way, what kind of regulation should we have? And finally, Yeshi Yadav, who teaches uh, corporate law at Vanderbilt, has dragged me into the dark world of digital currency. Uh, and you've been hearing a lot about cryptocurrency, I am sure. Uh, I could tell you a really funny story about how Sam Bankman Freed uh, destroyed my dining room table when he was very young, uh, but I'll, I'll just slide right by that. Um, uh, but, but one day when I was watching the news, I thought, oh my goodness. Um, but you know, what's interesting is whatever is the future of cryptocurrency, what is undeniably gonna happen is that central banks are going to be able, are going to soon issue 
digital currencies. They already are in other countries. And when the currency that you use isn't in your wallet, but it's in a digital wallet, the government is then going to have the data on, in fact, they're going to have to have the data on everywhere that you spend money. Every dollar that you spend is gonna be accounted for by the government. So all of this terrifies me, to be honest. Uh, and so if you're not scared, uh, if you haven't put down your potato chips and thought, well, golly, you should. Uh, and the question is, well, what do we do about it? So I gave you this framework of what we should do in terms of regulation. I mean, I don't think any of it should be going on without democratic deliberation and without a regulatory scheme in place. But then I had a couple of things happen in close proximity to one another it made me start to think in an odd direction about it. So the first was that a very, very large policing agency asked the help of the policing project in developing their policy on license plate readers. And I was like, great, because I have some pretty strong views about that. And we rendered assistance and we didn't get nearly as far as we'd like to have, and I don't like their policy very much, but it got me thinking, which is that I thought, you know, I know all the constitutional law about how if the government wants to go get your private information from you know, your cell site area or your bank or whatever, they have to have legal process. But damn, they just have all this information themselves. They can do whatever they want with it. There's no need for any process whatsoever. There's no need for a court whatsoever. They can just use it. And then Ryan and I uh, sat on the ethics board, the AI ethics board for Axon, which is the company that makes tasers and body cameras. And it's a different story why we're no longer on that AI ethics board. But Axon has this thing called Axon Evidence. And basically what Axon Evidence is, is a storage vault for police information. If you've ever been, I'm just curious, raise your hand if you've ever been in a bank where the safe deposit boxes are. Have you ever done that? Kind of a quaint older thing, but you know, it's just this guarded room with lots of little boxes where everybody can go put their birth certificates in there, you know, the pearls that they got from Grandma Jenny and whatever. Um, and, you know, if you think about what Axon Evidence is, it's just like that. It's just like each police department has a box. And that's fine. It's just a way to store data. In fact, it's probably more secure than policing agencies, which get hacked all the time for ransomware. But it's a little scary because what if they start sharing information among all the boxes? And what if they start using AI and running analytics on all the information and all the boxes? And that, that's scary and that's a problem to be solved. But when I juxtaposed the policing agency with the AL, ER data and Axon, I thought, you know what? If policing agencies are gonna have this stuff, which again, I'm ambivalent about, not, and, and, and I can't even answer that in just a yes, no. I mean, you have to say what stuff, and for, what, for how long? How are you retaining it? How are you using it? I thought, who should be holding it? Is it better if the policing agency holds it or if it's in private hands? And I came to the surprising conclusion, or I have come tentatively to the surprising conclusion that we'd all be safer if it wasn't in the government's hands. And then I started to think, but what does that look like? What does that even mean? And so I came up with, or I thought I made up, this idea of having what I, you know, I thought of as a two key solution or a multi-key solution, which is some private entity holds it, and if the police want to use it, they have to get permission from the key holders who all agree that they should have it. And why do I care about that? I care about that because if the police are going to have it, I don't want it misused. I don't want it used for surveillance that it shouldn't be. I worry a lot lately about authoritarian regimes and authoritarian regimes wanting to get hold of all this data that's been collected. And so I started to think about this idea of a multi-key solution. And I stumbled around and wondered, and then Sue Gluck pointed me to something I didn't know about at all called data trusts. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a data trust. So you all are more informed than I am. Uh, so you could, that's why we're gonna have the little help me out here in just a minute. So in case you don't know, the idea of a data trust was exactly like this thing I was imagining in my head. Um, and there was some writing done about it around this initiative uh, that, that uh, Sidewalk Toronto that was going to create a smart city in Toronto and everything was going to run on sensors and they were going to collect all the data. And one of the things that ultimately kiboshed that was that people were like, wait, that's a little scary. Why is the government holding all this data? And computer scientists in particular said, well, here's what you could do. You could dump all the data into a safe place. You can encrypt it all. 
And then you could have de-encryption keys that are held by different people who have to agree that the rules are being followed before the information is taken out. Uh, and only then you can only get what you need and it may be anonymized, blah, blah, blah. Here's an example, a practical example that they would talk about, which is you probably have heard of geofence warrants, which is, you know, six banks have been robbed. Somebody wants to know which cell phone or cell phones were in proximity to all six of the banks at the time that they were robbed. So there's a lot of debate about whether those warrants are constitutional or not. Put that aside for a minute. If all of that data sat in a data truck, what you could do is run the algorithm, find out which phones were near all the banks. And then if the key holders agreed, de-encrypt just that phone or phones. So that's the idea generally, like really vaguely, I told you, I warned you. So now I want you to help me, which is okay. What's the private entity? What, who holds the key? What's required to get it out? Like, what does that actually look like? I'm gonna stop except to tell you what I don't think it is. One thing about it. It does not overly impress me to hear that, oh yeah, well, we got a court order for you to get it. Because I think the rules to get things under court order are too sloppy and the cause standards are not high enough. But we could put that aside for just a minute because that's all the framework stuff I told you. We could set predicates for when the data comes out. But I'm still just don't know the answer to these questions about where does it get held and who gives permission and how does that thing work? I just think we need it. That's it. Can I just call on people if they raise their hands or do you want to call on people or? Sure, you have the prerogative. That's right, yep. Yeah, so Ryan's question was, um, how do we, how do I, or how do Danielle and I uh, think about uh, government getting information through public records requests? And the paper that Danielle and I are working on is hard because it's one thing to say, we're gonna have rules for when the police collect information. But it's another to say like, what if, you know, uh, uh, some companies giving the police information, like Ring. Well, it surely can't be the rule that you could just say, well, you can't give the police information. I mean, people give the police tips all the time. Or Ryan's question, which is, okay, I can file a public records request. You mean the police can't file a public records request? Right? It, that's what makes the paper that Danielle and I are writing so hard. But, and I don't have an answer yet. We're getting there. But Apropos of the thing I'm talking about today, one of the answers is a lot of that information isn't valuable until you aggregate it with a lot of other information and run analytics on it. And so, again, it just might be more information that goes into the vault. And the question then is, what are the rules that get it out of the vault? And it's not just you know public records requests, but you know one of the problems with government is government sometimes thinks that government should just have access to everything government has. But that can't be right when you think about digital currencies. I mean, that's just terrifying to think that, you know, the law enforcement agencies are just going to know where every one of us spends every dollar that we have. So even if the information exists, which I think is an a priori question that we all need to stop really seriously and think about, and pretty much we aren't, at least from a legislative perspective, you then have to figure out for the information that you are going to let law enforcement have, because at the moment, it's like everything. It's just a free for all. But if you're going to put regulation in place, you have to figure out where the information goes and, and what to do with it. Okay, I am the caller honor. Would you tell me uh, who you are?
Yeah, that's a great question. The question is, uh, if data comes in and uh, it's individual to you, how do we know that the data is tagged for you so that you might be one of the people that has to consent to the release of the data? That's a great question. The great thing about what I told everybody at the beginning is I don't have to have any answers to questions. So this is my usual academic talk. Um, I do, you know, I particularly don't have an answer to that question because the use case in my mind most often is a case where the government is aggregating data about a lot of people and uh, trying to figure out, you know, who's the responsible person or we're predicting is going to be a bad actor. And I don't really think of them as, as individuals as having standing in that situation to withhold the information coming out. So I want to think about cases in which someone might actually have standing to object to the release of that information. But it is that's interesting to think that we all, in some sense, could be one of the key holders uh, to information that's that's private to us. And there's something I find appealing to that. And of course, it echoes with the whole question about people having to you know, help crack open their phones when 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 people want to get into encrypted phones. Good. The question is, how does this work for public information like social media information? And again, this is what Danielle and I are struggling with because it seems really hard to say to law enforcement, uh, you know, I could go on Facebook and learn this. Like, why can't you do that? And you can have rules about things like uh, setting up false accounts. So you could regulate law enforcement. If, you know, can you use false accounts and friend people? Uh, so, so there's some kind of regulation that you can do. But you raise a good question with regard to the information that's just out there. Uh, and you know, one question, but this is the kind of question I'm grappling with is does that have to go in the vault with regard to law enforcement? Now, one of the reasons it matters is because, again, for a lot of the use cases that I think law enforcement wants the information, they want to aggregate it with other stuff. They already can do that now. And there are companies that will that are selling them that data and that are, you know. They'd be more than happy to let law enforcement know everything you're doing on social media. Uh, and so, again, partly what I'm worried about is the building of a dossier that incorporates a lot of different information. Uh, but that is a Danielle and Barry problem that we are working through uh, right now because it seems so artificial to say, well, everybody else can do it, so law enforcement can't. And that's, you know, cops say that to me all the time. Like, why shouldn't we be able to do this if everybody else can do it? Now, I do have an answer to that question. For what it's worth. It's because I can spy on you, but I'm not going to come to your house armed and haul you away. And so I actually think it's utterly appropriate to have a different set of rules. Uh, but I think we need to think through it because, uh, you know, I am not, I, I can't remember everything Ryan said about me and most of it wasn't true. But one thing that he did say that was true about me is I do try to be pragmatic about this stuff and even handed. And I do understand the imperative of public safety, people thinking, Okay, but we want to be able to find people who've done heinous things. On the other hand, I don't want to, you know, we could overcriminalize everything at this point in society, and that would not be a very pleasant place to live. We have examples of that on the planet. So, 
get the problem. You're gonna get a lot of that today, the whole, I get the problem. Thank you. Yes. One of the things that comes to mind is maintaining, like, maintaining the integrity of the non-government. Like the example that comes to mind is a private organization that is allowed to use that material. Uh, but like when this helps when we came to the work there, there was a lot of issues, there was a lot of issues that came up. Uh, Tell me where the there is again, sorry. That where there is the place. Yep, got it. That, that to me, because like, you know, if N like NCMEC needs to get more funding, they go to, and they go to ask Congress to put more funding in, and Congress would say no, they run out. So like, there's, there's a bunch of interesting things that come up on the table. I'm curious if that's something that comes to you. Yeah, so um, first, you know, on the center, so the question was, if you're going to create a private entity, do we need to worry about that? Like you're solving one problem, but are you creating another problem by putting it in private hands? So first, I just want to say with regard to something like exploited children or child pornography, I mean, this is this is information that now goes from private companies to law enforcement. And, and by the way, you know, in case it wasn't clear, it's just become, because storage space is so cheap, uh, even in Axon's lock boxes, everything just gets saved now. It's just, you know, it's the, Actually, my wife has the same theory of life. Like, just, we have it. Why throw it away? We might need it, you know, in five years. And that's why my some of the closets in my house look the way that they do. Uh, but I'm more worried about it when it's your private information. And I hope my wife isn't watching this soon. We're in big trouble. Um, so I'm actually not worried about the private entity part so much. And maybe I should be. Like, maybe that's silly of me. And you certainly get lots of issues in the world where, you know, like privatized prisons. What's the liability scheme? You don't have constitutional liabilities. So are there private remedies? I get the danger. But I guess I'm envisioning a really good private entity that is authorized by the government itself, and it's got a you know board of trustees, and it's set up in a way that people have figured out liability issues and access issues. And so it's not just kind of like uh, Axon says, "Wow, we heard that talk, and we're going to do that." Though there was a part of me when I was on the AI ethics board that kept thinking they ought to do that. Like one of the problems that Ryan and I grappled with a lot was, because you know when law enforcement gets this information from just anywhere is it okay to just keep it like should you have to prove that you have a warrant or something so i get the i get the concern uh here i'm oh, sorry in the back purple and then i'll come back forward yep
Yeah, so uh, the question is, what do we do about um, information that exists in silos now? And aren't there some arguments for being aggregated or put in one place? So among other things, researchers can find out about things that are important, like questions of social injustice. So I actually want to answer both sides of your question, the side that you asked and the side that you didn't ask, but that worries me. Um, so uh, one answer is silos to the thing that worries me. And in, um, you know, after Edward Snowden and all the concerns about the NSA holding all of our information, Congress ultimately opted for silos. What Congress opted for was uh, for the government to be able to get access to your telephone metadata, but the government couldn't hold it. I mean, this is kind of my model. It sat with the cell site providers and then they had to get it at the moment when there was cause to persuade a judge that we needed the information to find the terrorist on the loose or whatever. Now there's a problem with that, which I didn't understand um, uh, for a long time, which was the problem is the government can't do the analytics it really needs to do with that information quickly if it's existing in separate silos. So it turns out that not only was the NSA collecting all this information, but they were actually building their contact chaining charts, their charts of who'd been calling everybody and who, you know, who are all the calls that you'd made and who else, and storing that huge volume of data because that was the only way that they could quickly get to the, to the link in the node that they needed. I see some troubled faces in the audience. That is true. And I'm having a senior moment about whose book I read. It will occur to me um, that, that, um, that taught me that, but it was fascinating to read. I had never really thought about that. And that's actually when I understood what the stakes really were, because I didn't understand the stakes until that moment. And I also understood why the government was building these huge uh, uh, data um, pools, because they had to store all that information. So silos are a protection. And silos are something that we should think about. But there are bad things about silos. Now, your problem with silos uh, doesn't worry me, it angers me, which is, you know, these government entities are sharing this data. Uh, and Bridget Fahey at Chicago has written uh, a couple of good articles on this subject about how most of the data sharing that goes on, like even the, I can't remember what NCIC stands for, but that's the system that law enforcement calls them when they stop you uh, in a traffic stop. Like there's no formal authorization for that system. It's all done by MOUs. Uh, among law enforcement agencies. And I'm kind of like, well, where did they get off doing that? Like I literally, this is, Ryan's known me for a long time. This is my central shtick in all of policing, which is where do they get off doing this? Who gave them permission to do that? Like, I'd feel better if we'd given them permission. So, you know, in, the, in your example, uh, what frustrates me is they've got the information, they've got it available. There are data, uh, there are data sets that include, that are shared nationally, that include all the incident reports, all the, um, record management system data from the police departments, all the CAD, the computer assisted dispatch, you just can't get it. Uh, and so that's a problem that needs to be solved, but it's a, it's, it's a different kind of problem. And I'm, I'm very in favor of solving it. And by the way, the, the people that wrote some of these articles about data trust, that was their point, which was there are ways to collect the data and then either, and, and, and anonymize it. And I say that realizing that there are ways to de-anonymize data also, but then there are new technical solutions to avoid de-anonymization um, so that researchers could pull out what they needed. And partly what they could do is they could pull out what they need and not get what they don't need. So really what you probably want to know is kind of aggregate information. And you could get that without knowing anything about to whom it applied. I think you had your hand up, is that right? Yeah. You both had your, well, I'm, I'm favoring you, but if you'd like to, uh, yield the floor to your colleague there, that you should do as you wish. Yeah, you know, I, I find it pretty outrageous. And there, there have been attempts to legislate. There's the Fourth Amendment is not for sale act, which would do some of that. Um, 
But yes, if there's ever an area that just screams out for regulation, it's data brokers. And if we were having a different class today and we were talking about public choice theory and why things can get regulated or not get regulated, I'd be happy to explain uh, and talk about the legislative process that keeps that from happening. But you are certainly right. And just to generalize, you're not just right about data brokers, though they are a really big problem, but you are right about the whole ecosystem, which is that it all needs to be regulated. I mean, we all are living in a world in which it's perfectly clear to us that how our data gets collected and how it gets used needs to be regulated. And that's a big fight all of its own, but I think it's a different fight and a more pressing fight. Uh, I mean, I do care about my personal data a lot. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes people say, your generation especially, you know, you don't care about your data, you just turn it over to everybody. It's always a selfie here and a selfie there, and I want everybody to know where I am all the time. And, you know, but when you look at survey data, people actually don't think that. What they really do think is, I actually just want to enjoy the conveniences of life. They don't think that I should have to be giving up all of my data to enjoy them. So I feel that pretty fundamentally, but I feel it like way more fundamentally with regard to the people that exercise coercive force and surveillance on society. Like, I think it's a problem that just needs to be solved in that regard quickly. Okay. So the question is, um, what, is it another way to get at this problem just to make the point that with all of our Shazam data collection and analytics, we maybe aren't nearly as good as we think we are, right? And so it's one way to get the problem just to like make it clear that the government's going to, there are going to be errors that happen when the government goes into these big data pools. So first, I want to be clear. I am not standing here as an advocate for the government getting all this information and aggregating it. And if you've taken that away, I have failed. Uh, I am deeply worried about this from every direction. Uh, but the other is, in all the work we do at the Policing Project, and everything I write about, I was the reporter for the American Law Institute Project, Principles of Policing. Uh, my big thing is efficacy. Uh, this is, uh, there's a woman that works at the Policing Project, Katie Kinsey, who's prepared some awesome materials on facial rec by law enforcement. And one of the things Katie's just bullish about is, can you prove to us it's valuable? Now, I think that may be provable, but her point is, why do we just accept it? Like, why do we just believe that law enforcement needs all this, that it's going to be useful? Uh, and the, the air raid in policing is huge. I mean, bad things happen to people that they shouldn't all the time. Uh, so I'm there with you. I don't know whether the rest of the people who are uh, voting on things in this country are there with you. I'm not sure. Uh, there's a lot of blind faith in law enforcement, and I, I think that's bad. And one of the reasons I actually think it's really, really, really bad is because we are less safe because of it. Uh, we too often just are willing to trust what law enforcement does. When if we had open and honest conversations about it, we'd actually maybe do it better in cases that we wanted to. Yes. Thank you. 
I like the trope. So the question is, is anybody raising constitutional questions about whether we should all be able to give up our privacy to the extent uh, that we do? Uh, I'm not a privacy law scholar. We could ask Ryan that question. I am a constitutional law scholar. I'm not sure that would be a constitutional question of any sort because here at least con law is all about what the government does or doesn't do. Um, the court does talk about uh, this idea of giving up our privacy. And it's really interesting um, to watch the split on the court. So a court that might otherwise be all pro-law enforcement uh, really has split over digital privacy and law enforcement. Uh, and some of the justices in cases like Carpenter or Jones, uh, but particularly Carpenter, if Carpenter is a case about government acquiring cell site information, location information. And, it's really interesting to read all the opinions. It's also very long to read all the opinions. So you have to be hardy about it. But um, you know, some of the justices are of the view that, you know, yeah, we're handing out everything all the time, like too late, sorry. Uh, but some of them profoundly don't feel that way and feel that that is too trite an answer to the question of what the government should be able to get. Uh, and I find a little reassurance in that, but I have not heard that conversation about what we're permitted to give up or not. So because, um, so I'll give you a little bit more of an elaborate answer. So the question is, how could this happen that, you know, law enforcement has access to all this information? And so the non-technical answer is that Fourth Amendment law sucks. Uh, the more elaborate version of that answer is that um, a combination of whatever you do in public is not protected and whatever you give to a third party is not protected. And, uh, Carpenter, the case I just mentioned, started to make inroads into the third party doctrine, but the third party doctrine is just, I'm not sure it made sense when it first became a doctrine, that in a world in which actually we give everything that we have to a third party, it can't really be that none of that is protected from law enforcement, but that is a lot of where con law sits right now. And um, I write about that in, in my book, Unwarranted Policing Without Permission. You didn't mention that in the introduction, but it yeah. did, didn't sell any books for me there. Um, but one of the things I say in the book is uh, the problem is, I think the court's just really going to struggle with how to back out of the third party doctrine. I think it's clear that they have to, um, but it's not clear how they should. But the other thing I want to say, because it's important to always say this, is why should we rely on constitutional law anyway? This is all should be a matter of regulation. There should be laws on the books in every state that governs access to all of our data, and we desperately need those. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Yeah.